King Kong 2005. We have finally made it to a movie that I've wanted to talk about for a very long time. To make a long story short, this is the Peter Jackson one. This was his passion project. This is the one that he wanted to make more than anything else. And this is the first King oh, Kong movie in America since King Kong Lives. So they didn't leave off the series on the best note, but it was just a quagmire of rights issues and just a whole bunch of a mess. But to talk about this movie, I have one third of the Small Talk podcast from 3D Movie Cinema. It's Jacob Collins. Jacob, how you doing? I am doing fantastic, man. And I am so used to having Matt here because I'm like thinking like, <laughs> Matt, what do you think? And I'm like, fuck, he's not here. So it's like, <laughs> I almost thought about asking Matt to join us too. Just like, hey, Matt, can we, need to, we need to have this. But no, but no, I'm like, no, I have to get this smile. And I'm like, you know what? This is a fantastic movie we're going to talk about. I'm really excited. I love King Kong. I literally have a King Kong from McFarlane Toys of him chained up from the 1970s film, I believe, or 1930 film of him in chains and then like the little Anne and his arm. I really, I, I like the 30 film. I actually have never seen the, when it, in black and white, I've seen it in color. So there's like a colored version of it, you know, that I saw from illegal means. Uh, uh, I was going to say, I, like, where did you see that? <laughs> yeah, I saw it on a website. I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure there's a colored version out there, but like I saw it on a pirate you know i, I mean not, not a part of it. i saw it from means of where <laughs> like yeah, you know I, that years site, ago years the site years. that is whispered in hushed tones among yes people. i saw that years ago and i watched it and i loved it i was like it's it's really like an hour or something minutes and i'm like you know and apparently that film was hitler's favorite film apparently you well, know interesting <laughs> yeah I, I mean the whole i mean if you think about it, the whole idea of the movie is like, I don't know, I was looking facts about that movie, and I said, this is Adolf Hitler's favorite film. And I'm like, well, I mean, the whole movie is about Americans and giant ape killing Americans. I mean, like, oh, I could see why. <laughs> like, especially in the third act of that movie, King Kong's just destroying the entire city, you know? Well, I, I as for the 70s movie, I did not care much for it because I felt like it was too comedic. Like, there's just so, like, it's just played for laughs in a lot of scenes. So I felt like I just didn't care for it. But as for this film, I feel like Peter Jackson really really capture the magic of this movie because you know peter jackson really loves king kong in fact if you ever watch his first movie which is brain dead or dead alive you know it depends it's either called brain dead in some markets it's called dead alive i think in ours he literally has the first act of the movie back when the zombie virus if they go the it's literally on skull island <laughs> yeah I, I i looked that up earlier and i'm like yeah, the uh, the King Kong love goes way back, and uh, I I learned there was like an unauthorized biography on Jackson, and it said in the biography that one of the first movies he ever made at twelve years old was trying to recreate recreate King Kong. He stole his mom's fur coat, and she and he made like the suit off of that, and it was just his mom was not happy about that. But uh, turns out, while this movie did come out in two thousand and five. This movie was actually supposed to come out in the 90s. And I'm glad I and I'm glad I got Jacob on here because he knows way more about this than I do. So uh, tell us about King Kong 96. Well, King Kong 96 is essentially a movie where it was gonna be like this entire new different thing. It was gonna be, I would say, closer to the mummy than it was gonna be closer to, you know. King Kong. First off, it would have started in 97, okay? It would have been called King Kong 97, all right? So we would not have seen, and apparently Kate Winslet was going to be to play the lead. It would not have been Naomi Harris. No, Naomi. It's Naomi. It's Naomi, Naomi Watts. Watts. Naomi Watts. She would have not been the lead. It would have been Kate Winslet because Peter Jackson had worked with her and even visited her about the movie on the set of The Frighteners. Not on The Frighteners, sorry on the set of um titanic that's the one yeah yeah so uh yeah they were gonna make that but then what happened was they're like they, the whole eye opening started differently it started in like they were going to skull island and everything happened and then of course you know jack was gonna be like this heroic like brandon fraser character like from the mummy and, and then of course like he was gonna get in the helicopter at the end and they were gonna shoot down kong with bissels and everything and 
it was good but most of the movie played out the exact same way but like the opening was different a few other things they changed in the movie and they made jack more of a hero rather than the writer and he made a more indiana jones you know it was more archaeological thing and everything but what happened was and robert zemeckis was going to produce it but what happened was mighty joe young come out and flopped then godzilla 98 come out and flopped so the same so the producers felt like well, the same studio that made this is going to, the same studio, it's going to be made at Fox, I believe, too. And so the same studio felt like, well, the same people that are what, just like with the rings in the Friday 13th movie, where when it got shut down, the studio felt like, well, the same people I saw Mighty Joe Young and King Kong are going to be the same audience. And so they're like, you know what we should do? We should cancel this project. So Peter Jackson was, when, was not going to make Lord of the Rings either. He was not going to make, he literally passed on it with the Weinsteins and told them, Look, I really want to make King Kong. So he passed on Lord of the Rings, went over to make this movie, and did he even built he even built the studio a skull? Uh, I saw his Kong skull with his Wada team. And then what happened was whenever it whenever the production fell through with the movie, they literally were like literally they were literally like they were so like Peter Robert Zemeckis felt so bad, and Peter Jackson asked for the skull back. Because that way it sits in his wingnut office at Wingnut in New Zealand. And so Robert Zemeckis was like, felt bad. So he hired the entire crew on the Frighteners and told Wet, if you want to come, so rather than being unemployed, y'all can work on the Frighteners with me. And so they were all cool with that. And so, of course, Peter Jackson went back and worked on Lord of the Rings. And now, after Lord of the Rings, he got the job. Only he didn't want Kate Winslet. He wanted, like, he wanted to find someone younger because she felt like she was too old at the time. And he wanted to find a newer actress for Anne, and he changed some things. Like he wanted, to, he said originally, Faye, uh, who was the the one that played in the 1930s film? Uh Faye, uh, Faye Ray. Faye Ray was gonna appear. Like he wanted her to appear at the end. Say it was Beauty that killed the Beast, but she turned it down originally. But then when it time came time to shoot this movie, she said yes, and she was gonna appear, but she passed away before filming began. Wow, rest in peace, Faye Ray. But uh, yeah. yeah, that that's like. That seems like a like one of those like it's kind of like the offer the Paramount Plus show you can make like a movie about the making of like the movie that never was and, and like think of the world we would live in if Peter Jackson legitimately like he legitimately turned down Lord of the Rings and was like I want to make King Kong instead and then was like this is taking too long all right I'll do Lord of the Rings and created three of the greatest movies of all time. It, like in the meantime and and he's like oh well might as well it, it's like it's so weird thinking that it's like a paradigm shifting kind of moment if you really think about it well there's a couple of reasons why he turned down lord of the rings he said one was the wine things were going to do it and they wanted that one of the hobbits to die at the end one of like mary or pippin to die and so peter jackson says i want to do it faithfully but at the same time I'm, I'm willing for clay to liberties but the hobbits should not die do you not understand that's not the whole point of this yeah. So yeah. apparently Peter Jackson was kind of all right. And they were kind of making some weird decisions and stuff like that. Like they wanted like Sean Connery to play Dumbledore. No, not Dumbledore. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Harry Potter fans and Lord of the Rings. I'm so sorry. Gandalf, not Dumbledore. <laughs> but yeah, they wanted Sean Connery to play Gandalf and everything. And it was just becoming like a nightmare for Peter Jackson. So once Peter Jackson literally like walked away and they lost the rights to that, they gave up the rights. And so, and then by the time he got we keep king kong 97 had gotten canceled he after he got a skull back they said that warner brothers had obtained the rights to lord of the rings or they were in negotiations a uh, new line was in the negotiations so they were they were looking at lord of the ring rights and so he literally like he was talking to robert zemeckis and they said what do you want to do and he or not robert zemeckis robert shea bob shea who was the head of new line he said, i want lord of the rings i want to do all three of those movies and then he goes, what if you do them all at once? And then the rest is history. But uh, but it's it's a weird, like, altered timeline. Of, like, who would direct Lord of the Rings if it wasn't for Jackson? Like, like it's a world that is, like, intriguing, but it's also... Chris one, Columbus. I, Chris Columbus. That That's... That's that's a rather odd choice, but I mean... I'm Chris just joking. Columbus. I'm just throwing the name out. That'd be an interesting choice, to say the least. I mean, the dude was still relevant. He had made, he was in the middle, or he was either about to make or just made Harry Potter uh, 1. I believe that was 02. 
So we would be in that ballpark. But it would be just, it would be very interesting. But it's, regardless, it's one of those stories that you look at it and you just go, wow. Like, like it's one of those stories that makes you think. But uh, the point- like the Beatles making Lord of the Rings. Rebecca, and that story was Stanley Cooper. <laughs> Stanley Cooper, if you don't know, was going to make Lord of the Rings. And like the, the Beatles were going to star as the, as the Hobbit. I'm like, that would have been amazing. And also, that would have been probably one of the worst movies ever made of Stanley Kubrick's. Well, it would have got one film, would not have gotten sequels. It would not. It would have been like the Willow situation. Well, it was, well, it came across because George Harrison is a was a huge fan of movies like so much so that he created his own production company handmade films like if you've ever enjoyed a movie called monty python and the holy grail you can thank george harrison for producing that so uh, among other many other movies so uh yeah the beatles lord of the rings i remember when jacob martin and i reacted to that we just were like good lord that is it's amazing and awful at the same time Keep it secret. Keep it safe. But uh, let's get into... Uh... My precious. Oh, my precious. Oh, I guarantee you they would have sung. They would have had to have sung. Oh, of my course. My precious. My precious. <laughs> I'm just... now, now you're kind of sounding like Sam Neill from Peaky Blinders. <laughs> but uh, but, but uh, yeah, this movie I'm excited for. Peter Jackson's King Kong. Yeah, let's get into that. And... Uh, Unlike the 76 version, this feels very much like a remake of the 30s one. It's very Peter Jacksonified. It has a lot of his, like, it has his fingerprints all over it. But this comes about as close to recapturing the magic of the 30s one as you can get. It doesn't get there, but, like, how can you really, conceivably? But uh, I feel like kind of reversing it the biggest problem that i have with the movie is that it's too long it's three hours and eight minutes long and jacob you and i were talking before we went and started recording this you have the four hour edition of this this is four hours like were there even more boat shots like what (laughs) well i mean the scenes are literally like they're longer scenes of like jack and you know them looking for Anne. there are a couple of other scenes that were cut from the movie that were up there, like there was a like one other fight scene with like another and another uh, uh, creature, and like there are also there's longer scenes of like in New York before they go to Skull Island, and there's longer scenes on the ship, and there's like one scene that you know, and there's also one more scene I believe with Ann, with a uh, Ann and Kong before like you know I I will say the scenes it's not a bad like, but I'm just saying like I do think both versions I don't really think the only thing is I have it on 4K the extended cut. And I'm going to tell you now, it's a terrible 4K restoration cut because it looks like somebody pirated it. Like the upscaling looks like somebody pirated like the Blu-ray version and tried to make it 4K. Like every time I watch it, you could tell where it's like, okay, this looks like, this is terrible. Like restor- And the sad thing is I wanted to watch the Blu-ray extended cut and, and I, it's only on the 4K and I'm like, I have to watch the shitty cut of the movie. I'd watch a shitty like r- blueprint of the movie to watch. So yeah, but yeah, I like Peter Jackson's King Kong. I do. I do think yes, yeah, long, very long. And also, have you seen? How many times have you seen this movie? I've seen it three times. I saw it in theaters when I was super young. I watched it like in the 2010s, and then I rewatched it for the sake of this review. So I've seen it at least three times. Yeah, the movie's not bad. No, no, far from it. There's clearly a lot of tender loving care you could tell peter jackson had a passion for it It just it's a test on like on like the human endurance because i was just sitting there like how long are they on this boat and then it it diverts to how many times can king kong like look lovingly into naomi watts's eyes i'm I'm just like fuck naomi watts huh i i i I read a letterbox review that said something to the tune of to the tune of this gorilla was was thinking that she, that he was going to have sex with her. <laughs> and, and we were talking about how this was all done on a soundstage. And, but I mean, I can't argue with some of the results. Some of the CGI doesn't look super great, but 
I love the shots of New York. Like I love, I love the vintage look. I love the old cars of uh, the hot dog stands, like a car runs into one in one scene, the old vintage ads. There's like an old ad for universal pictures up there, which I figured that would be, that'd be rather like obvious that they didn't do that. And there's even, even the opening credits are very classic, like very much like a, like a 30s style opening like nothing like really dynamic it's just an opening with like not columns but I'll, I'll throw up a picture so you all will know what i'm talking about but there but jackson felt it felt like jackson was trying to capture like a vintage feel to it and mostly i i think that it worked but yeah uh what it is is i think honestly peter jackson is a really talented filmmaker and so basically, you know, I really appreciated that Peter Jackson did this, you know, movie. He didn't have to do this movie. I mean, we almost didn't get this movie. He literally almost made it. We almost didn't get Lord of the Rings because of this movie. You know, like 97, King Kong 97. Can you imagine? I honestly think there are things I dislike about this movie. Like, honestly, I kind of wish Jack Black was the main villain of the movie, the human villain. So I feel like there is no human villain compared to, you got to think, okay, he's a sleazy filmmaker. So really, he should be killed by Kong. You know, but at the same time, I think the movie tries to humanize him more. See, I, I kind of like, I mean, Jack Black is like, I, I really like him as an actor. I think he's very charismatic and talented, but I, I like, I like how they kind of make him like, like a filmmaker with big dreams, but his dreams like outweigh the scale of like his talent for lack of a better word. Uh, there's a line in the movie where, where he is like defeat is only temporary or something like that. But I love that line unironically. Well, there's one guy's like, will there be boobies in your movie? And he goes, no, I want to be respected. Like, I'm just like, <laughs> like. Did DeMille at? <laughs> then on top of that, my, they're like, they told Naomi, there's like a lot of sexual references to this movie. I mean, like she goes to audition for a movie and there's like a woman that she sees all these women that are like, like prostitutes or whatever, like naked theater and stuff like that. And she's like, no, I'm. She, I like that the character has more, more her, has more respect for herself than that, you know. And so she's like, I'm not gonna do this. And then Jack Black literally, she tries to rob and steal, and Jack like offers her like to be in this movie. At first, she thinks it's a smut film, <laughs> and then she realizes like, no, we're gonna shoot a film. I there is some things I like, like, like how Jack Black doesn't want the writer to leave the ship, so he tries to keep writing. He keeps trying to check bad checks. And yeah, keep to uh, Adrian Brody, and uh, is like. You just wrote the two on here. I'm like, oh, sorry, let me start again. <laughs> but he's like, and he's like looking up to see, is like, all right, we're good to go. And like, oh, well, you're stuck here. <laughs> like, 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 he's not like a scumbag. Like, a, he's a he's a likable scumbag, I, I guess. <laughs> Which, I mean, to be fair, yeah, I mean, Black, Jack Black did a good job at this movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I just said Black Jack, like, 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 imagine Jack Black plays Black Jack. They should literally, I'm saying Casino should do a commercial with Jack Black. Says, it's Black Jack with Jack Black. <laughs> At least a picture of Jack Black holding cards going. Next year's Super Bowl. There you go. <laughs> for a casino ad. Uh, which, you know, I'm just saying. Um, but yeah, Jack Black is really good. Adrian Brody, like, here's the thing about him. He's an actor where sometimes you like him, sometimes you don't like him. And I think in this movie, he is a, he's like the unwilling hero that, look, I just want to write my own play. And he kind of becomes that hero, like the unwilling hero is like, look, I want to go and try to save Anne, you know? And so unfortunately, you know, and then uh, Kyle Chandler's in this movie, which ironically he's in Godzilla versus King Kong and King Godzilla, you know, Godzilla, King of the Monsters. And he's also in this movie, but like this movie has nothing to do with that movie though. Like he just plays like an actor that really wants to be like, like he's like literally like a like a Claude Rains or like you know a Clark Gable, and then he's like a coward too. He's like you know like I remember somebody writes a gives him a mustache. Maybe he goes hey, and he's like, hmm. You know, I legit forgot that Kyle Chandler was in not. I forgot he was in this movie, but then I just forgot. Oh yeah, he's the dad to Millie Bobby Brown in the MonsterVerse movies. I completely forgot about that. I'm just saying. Like, yeah, which, I mean, he's a better character, I think, in that movie than this one. Oh, movie. by far, yeah. He's like a coward in this one. He's like, oh! Like, he just starts running, like, when I remember when the, remember the chase sequence of the animals? And he runs, he's running faster than anyone. And I'm just like, what? 
You see, like, the, thing, the thing about Adrian Brody is that I low-key always forget that he won an Oscar for The Pianist. <laughs> like, like I, I always forget. I'm like, yeah, he won an Oscar, didn't he? Turns out he did. I think this year, because he was in The Pianist this year in King Kong. So, like, it was in the 06 Oscars. So it was a weird timeline. Yeah, I, this movie though. I mean, also I like the there. There's a couple things. That, there's a, fun, a couple of fun facts about the movie. Andy Serkis, who played Gollum, he's he the cook, plays but he also plays plays Kong. So two roles, roles, basically. Yeah, and also like like there's a scene like where he says, "You know what this means, right? It's the abominable snowman." <laughs> and I'm just sitting there laughing, going, "We're in a jungle. <laughs> like, at what way would there be? There's no snow around." I'm like looking like. We're, they're in a jungle. How would there be an abominable? Hey, I would have just said, I wish that Adrian Brody says, why don't you guess again? <laughs> like, try guessing again. Because everybody rolls their eyes like, oh my God, this guy's nuts. Like, <laughs> like where's the snow? But uh, the thing about Andy Serkis, I always like forget what he looks like as a human because he's been under like mocap for so long. He's Gollum, he's Caesar, he's King Kong in this. He's Whenever I see it, capture. when he was like Ulysses Claw in the MCU, I'm like, that's Andy Serkis. <laughs> wow. Like, I didn't know he looked You know what like... I always remember him from? 13 what? going on 30. Yes, he was in that movie. He's he... Jennifer Aniston's boss in that movie. With the horrible Just for Men die job. Like, pitch black hair. <laughs> yeah. He was in that movie. I just remember him being in that movie. And he's also in... There's an old shitty... I don't know if it's shitty. It kind of shitty. That's yeah, shitty. But he's great in it. Um, it's an old Brandon Fraser film called Ink Heart. I remember that movie. I remember and he's the bad guy. At, seeing it at my local theater. That's not a theater anymore. It's an MMA gym. But I remember seeing that, and I was I was really into that one. That was like the year before Brandon Fraser disappeared off the face of the earth, only to return for the whale and win an Oscar. And it's like I, no, I would say Furry Vengeance was the last time we seen. Furry Vengeance. Oh, Furry Vengeance. That movie's awful. God. I liked at the SAG Awards that last year, he was like, where were you all for, like, it was cheering him on. Says, where were you all when Furry Vengeance came out? I could have used you then. Does anyone <laughs> have any Purell? <laughs> I, I literally, you know, at one time we had bad weather here, and it was recorded. I wanted to put something, in our, and we have direct TV, so the DVR went out. The, the, the direct TV went out. The signal went to the satellite. And so basically, I went to DVR recordings, and Furry Vengeance was one of the recordings. I guess my sister had recorded it, so I put it, put it, push play, and I end up watching Furry Vengeance. This reminds me of Yogi Bear. Oh God, Justin Timberlake and Dan Aykroyd as yeah. Boo Boo and Yogi, respectively. Yeah. I was watching that, going, "This reminds me of Yogi Bear." Like it's just literally live action people. And the see, the thing is, the creatures are in the in that movie are all puppets mostly. Yogi Bear, though, was all CGI and just like literally Tom Cavanaugh, which I don't understand why they cast Tom Cavanaugh as Ranger. Like, Will Ferrell's right there. You could have literally ca you cast Tom Cavanaugh. Like, and I, I like Tom Cavanaugh, but he's yeah. great as a reverse flash, but like, yeah. I just didn't like thought. I thought he was a, a weird choice, really, a weird choice. Like, that was like, it's like kind of cast, it'd be like trying to cast Dan Aykroyd as the lead in King Kong 05. But, uh, Going back to King Kong, I, I do like when they get to Skull Island, like I love how the island looks. Like I don't know how the rocks became to look like skulls, but that was like a nice touch where they get shipwrecked and you look at every rock that's in the water, you're like, oh, that looks like a skull. That's interesting. I wonder who carved that. And then there's the big wall, and then you got the natives, and then you basically yeah. find out the island's full of dinosaurs, which that's a this movie low key is a better Jurassic Park movie than all the Jurassic World movies combined, and I am so serious when I say this that. came out. This came out like around like after Jurassic Park three. Yeah, like four Jurassic years Park after three years. came out in oh one, so this is four years after that movie. Yeah, yep. And this movie, I mean, this movie has a, has a lot of great moments, like especially when the movie starts out. You have like a problematic scene that I guarantee you, Peter Jackson would say. We're gonna cast actual natives. We're not gonna cast uh, white people and put a black face on them. <laughs> yeah, because I I say that the King Kong from thirty three is like one of the greatest monster movies ever made, but like 
there's some pretty bad like blackface in in that movie and there's and this one too this one has the same like i'm like there's a white woman like a little girl in black covered in blackface and i'm like yeah this movie has some issues you have to look at the issue this movie is not doesn't age well in some parts of it but like other than that like there's a cool scene i will say where they're holding like they're they're literally putting them right there on the pedal they're smashing their heads like i'm like what this is a king kong remember that scene yes they're gonna put their heads there and they go i'm like I'm like this isn't a king kong this isn't a movie this is in an actual king kong movie this is not like also there was a scene that was originally cut in the movie that was actually going to be cut this was not going to be in the theatrical it's not going to be anywhere and it was in the 30 film that they, they cut, shot it but it was too too horrific so they had to cut it so they had to get rid of it and it was the scene where, like, when they fall off the bridge and everything, and like the monsters, these like these elite spiders and all that show up, and they're they're fighting for their lives, where the creatures are trying to kill them, like the worms and all that stuff. Like Andy Circus gets his head eaten by a like worm, and like yeah. that scene, they said it was too horrific originally, like in the thirty film. That th so Peter Jackson said, "I'm going to put it in my film," and then he put it in his film, and the studio even said that might be what we might get an R rating for that scene, so you might have to cut it. Yeah, like, uh, you might want to cut that. When he, he, Andy Serkis is literally getting his head eaten by a worm. Like, a, I'm like, oh, God. And like, he's I'm just swinging so... the machete around, like, trying to chop at anything. It's a crazy <laughs> scene, y'all. I mean, like, yeah, they're literally getting machine. They're about to get killed. They're literally about to get killed. And they're, like, they're all fighting to their death as a creature. There's more getting over overcome. And then all of a sudden, to, like, like all the other guys... The, the most bullshit Hollywood thing happens where like all the all the people on the ship come to the rescue and just go like Kyle Chandler has a machine gun going da -da 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 -da, and miraculously killing the creatures. I'm just like, I what I would have done differently. I would have done differently is I would have did like the Brendan Fraser mommy thing where they find like a cave or something. And then, like, they're all like, come on, come on, come on. Adrian Burr's like, come on, come on, come on. And then, like, one stand behind. Andy Serkis should have stayed behind. And then he gets eaten alive by all the creatures. Wow. I would have did that instead. I would have said, because I'm like, it's just so fake, though, that, like, you know, like, oh, you're like, oh, oh like, you're, but I do think that was a great sequence of Andy Serkis getting his head eaten by a Like, that, you know, like, they're, like, all just putting, also, there was a scene, the bridge scene with or not it's not a bridge scene it's a they're on a tree stump and king kong like you know and there's a guy jamie bell there's a thief is like a like a, a, a first mate or, or he's like on the sh she's on the ship and he yeah. basically and there's a african-american gentleman who literally like over is like the first mate to the captain he oversees everything and literally he's trying to like the guy's name is uh the jamie bell's character played jimmy and he always gets like mad at him because he tries to steal all the time and so the first mate, literally, I like how when he sees King Kong, he gets killed. Like he throw King Kong throws him, and then he just falls to his death. And then he's like, "Nah," like I mean, it just that scene, like you know, like especially the Skull Island is like this mystical place. And then, like I will say, I think it's really messed up how like they're literally gonna kill them, but then they show up, and then they start shooting at him, they leave, and then they take him, but then they show back up and they kidnap Anne on the boat. I kind of found that hard to believe. I'm like. Wouldn't it have made more sense just to take her there and then leave? Yeah, yeah, it would make sense. Because it's just like they take her instead, it's just like this. It's like they show up, they're like, all right, she's back on the ship. Then they sneak onto the ship. And I'm like, okay, like, all right. I, I, I think, honestly, this movie, I if I was making it, I would not have started in, in New York. I would have started when they got to the ship. I would have started when they got to the ship, and then you could explain all through dialogue. Like you could explain like how Jack is a like you could have literally put Easter eggs there to like get, fill in the gaps. Like okay, as Jack they're leaving, he's trying to get everybody on the ship. You could have did the chat thing, and then by the time like the ship is leaving, and all of a sudden the police like you know, the police and his producers pull up, but you don't know who that is, and you find out through the story. Oh, that's his. Then that's what I would have done. I would have made it like okay, you could have cut like a good forty five minutes out of this movie. You know, but I mean, Peter Jackson wanted to tell his true tradition. I also like how, like, Anne is trying to meet. She's a big fan of the playwright uh, of Adrian Brody's character, Jack. And so she thinks it's one, his, uh, the, the sound guy or whatever, or the director of photography or whatever. And literally is like, oh, you're, I'm such a big fan of your work, but you're not as handsome. And you're like, and then, like, or was it, you're very, or you're more, <laughs> and then 
<laughs> Adrian Brody's just sitting there listening. Like, oh, oh, am I? Like, hmm, okay. Like, he's just sitting there listening. And then she realized, like, that's Jen. And he's like, hi. Like, you know, stuff like that is really, I like. And also, I like the, the, the scene where, like, King Kong, she's trying to do, like, a juggling act. And, like, you know, I thought that was great. I also thought there's a scene. All right. So the, the, the fight scene between the T Rex and Kong. That is an epic fight scene. Oh, yeah, that was so good. Like, it takes a while to get there, but like, like I just, I love that so much. And you don't see it until it's like she's lay on, laying on top of the T-Rex, and then that's there, when T-Rex tries to go up. There was a part of me, though, that, that would be like like how she's thrown around and caught. I'm like, that would break some bones at the very least, but she's you know like what? The, the rest of it is so fun that I kind of don't care. It, it's like, like like King Kong just like punching a dinosaur just is just that's it rips its jaw like this goes that's yeah. cinema right there that like, and I was kind of feel bad I kind of felt bad for the dinosaurs I'm like don't kill them you know but it's at the same time you're like this is cool though <laughs> like you know like honestly like I didn't want them to fight I'm like come on leave them this like can't they just go away can't they just go away <laughs> but also I do like um but yeah that sequence was actually not directed was not directed by Peter Jackson. It was well, it mostly was, but then like what happened was, Peter Jackson had gotten sick on, during the production, and Brian Singer, who was directing Superman Returns at the time, was like you know he was scouting, he wasn't sh- directing it, he was scouting for Superman for, and so I guess they were shooting in the same location, and so like his producer, and so like the producers of the movie said like hey look his wife and whatever it's like look he's sick and he because apparently peter jackson's got like was overshooting the movie and he was staying up night and day and he was just like he was just exhausted because he's like literally like peter jackson's just sitting in a chair going like this like hey um and like you can tell andy circus is in like a little cgi motion capture suit <laughs> and naomi replaces it like you know on like a green screen with lots of jungle and then he like he goes up there and shakes andy circus's hand and naomi's hand like hi hi and then he goes I'm just, he says, can you just like, you know, just shoot it, but keep it down. He says, can you like just shoot it, but just try to keep it down some. I'm going to, I'm going to go take a nap over there. <laughs> so Peter Jackson's just sleeping in the chair. I buy it singer. It's, they, literally it's all on the Superman returns, Brian Singer video diary documentary where Brian Singer has got a microphone. Goes, all, right, sh- sh- all right, let's keep it down. And like, he's like, he goes through the pages with like him and his team. He's looking at the pages and Peter Jackson, like, this is the scene we're shooting. And he goes, all right, so can you do this? Brian Singer's like, can you do this? And can you just like like this and like the TX is coming at you and then Andy Circus is like doing this and everything. And <laughs> it's it's actually really funny and he's looking over at Peter Jackson and Peter Jackson just like just sleeping in a chair, completely like, knocked out. He's just gone. Like it's like honestly, I would have said I would have told Peter like look because they were playing loud music like they already had the music I guess done and they were playing the music during the fight scene and everything and all of a sudden Brian Singer's directing it and all of a sudden Peter Jackson's like in the chair sleeping <laughs> and all of a sudden I'm just thinking and he's like telling them like I keep it down I keep it down and I'm like there's no way to keep it down we're directing a scene I would have said Peter you want to go like find an office or something and go lay down there and then I, I'll and Peter was just like he went he you could if you're looking at him you're like, oh, he did not care. He was just like, I'm out. <laughs> like, <sighs> like, he was just done. And I'm like, just thinking, I'm going was, to bed. <laughs> like, he's, I'm just going to bed right here in this chair. And so Brian Singer directs the scene. And then, of course, like a- 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 afterwards, like a couple hours later, Peter Jackson get, wakes up and he's like, all right, thank you, mate. Thank you. Thank you so much. And everything. He goes, thank you. So an honor. And then he leaves. And I'm just thinking, I would have been like, I guarantee you nowadays that would probably be against SAG law. SAG law would be like, oh, you can't do that. You know, you yeah, yeah, that that would be kind of sus. But just to think about it, like like <laughs> it's the wild the west TGA. back in the early two thousands. But yeah, uh, like he literally asked Peter Jackson to come. Peter Jackson asked Brian Singer because they were, I guess, they were looking for a, a director that was available because Peter Jackson was like, like I, I guess maybe his first DP was directing, like trying to direct scenes because Peter Jackson was out of it, and they're like. Could you direct a scene for me? As like they handed him the script and the shooting the shooting schedule, and he's like, um, "This scene right here, we're gonna do this." And then he gave a few notes, and then of course they were directing. And then Peter Jack, I, I just thought that scene was funny as hell. I'm gonna, just, I'm gonna, we're gonna put it in the videos so y'all can watch it. So it's freaking crazy. You're just like, this is literally your Peter Jackson literally sleeping in a chair. <laughs> he's like, <sighs> but uh, <laughs> to uh, to bring it home, I, I do like. I do. I will say one thing. 
I did like the third act of the movie whenever they go to New York and how Jack, they try. And then all of a sudden, Peter Jack's just throwing peep women looking for Anne and she's just throwing women down. Then it becomes like this beautiful like chase sequence with the militaries after him. And it becomes really emotional. And I especially like how at the end, uh, the pilots play one played by Frank Darabout. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And the other one I think was going to be Brian Singer, but then I guess he was shooting in heavy shooting Superman Returns, so he couldn't do it. And then they shoot King Conda. And I remember his death is so emotional because he just wanted to be loved and he just gets shot. And then how he falls to death. And then, of course, like Jack Black goes, it was beauty that killed the beast. You know, everything. It's, it's such a beautiful, emotional movie. And I think this is a really well done movie. What about you, Brian? Uh, yeah, you're never going to recapture the 30s magic. But I think that I think that Peter Jackson came about as close as any. I'm going to give this a great rating. It is too long in places, but really that's like my biggest problem with it. There's, there's a lot to like here, but uh, thank you so much, Jacob, for coming on to talk about this one. You will be back. I mean, you are part of small talk, so you're going to be back every week, but yeah, in a, in a series similar to this, you will be back. But, uh, but your channel, as always, will be linked in the description. What do you got uh, coming up? Uh, well, uh, I got coming up uh, is I got a Ghostbusters 2 review with Jason, the old millennial. And then, uh, of course, I got Small Talk with you. And then, of course, I got a video review for uh, – not video. Yeah, I got a video review for um, – a video game review for Starfield. I keep forgetting about that. That's the one thing I keep forgetting about. And then on Friday, I got a review for Poor Things. Yeah, and uh, Jacob's channel's linked in the description. Go give him a subscribe there. And as for, the, well, as for the channel, Small Talk every Tuesday, Jacob is a part of it. Matt Wyatt is also a part yeah. of it. He will be joining me on this road to Godzilla x Kong to review Godzilla vs. Kong from 2021. But as far as this series goes, coming up this Saturday, we will be returning to the world of Godzilla and reviewing Godzilla's return, at least from Toho. It is 2016's Shin Godzilla. 